going off topic. Off topic? You really off topic right now. Yo, you way off topic. How is it that everybody's over here and you way over there off topic? All right, what's going on, family? Uh, welcome back to Going Off Topic with Brother Omawale. Uh, today we have a very special guest in the building with us, my brother James Wilson, a.k.a. James the Writer. It's always a, a pleasure when I have a fellow writer slash author uh, visiting us on Going Off Topic. What's going on? What's good with you, brother James? Man, how you doing, brother Omawale? <clears throat> Omawale, I'm good, bro. All right, all right. You ready, you ready to get into it? Hey, man, I've been wanting to talk to you for a while, bro. That's 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 good. That's good. I mean, so you got a big smile on your face, man. So you are you already picking up my energy, man. So that's a that's a good thing. You know, you you know you another Garveyite, bro. So you know, absolutely, absolutely. The presence of one of us, you know, it feels like I'm at home. You know what I mean? That's love, bro. That's love. So talk, so, uh, t- uh, talk to me about Garvey, right? One of the, uh, the first book that I've ever saw that you wrote was called "Teach Me About About Garvey." So. Why Garvey? Why was that the inspiration for your first book? Yeah, so I'm a father. And one of the things about being a father is you're very conscientious of what's presented to your children. And growing up, let me just say this. I didn't learn about Marcus Garvey until I was about 25 years old. And when I learned about Marcus Garvey, I thought he was made up because I'm like, surely they wouldn't keep a figure like him away from black children. You know what I'm saying? And the more I got to dig in and research, and I'm like, this is absurd, you know? And so being a father, having two children of my own, I was seeking literature about Mr. Garvey for them, um, in addition to the literature that I was reading myself. And there's not much. So I decided instead of complaining and you know pointing the finger at the educational system, which is designed to fail us anyway, I went on and put my money where my mouth was and created Teach Me About Garvey. But the reason I wrote about Marcus Garvey, Brother Omawale, is because Marcus Garvey was one of the key figures in uniting the African world. And not just uniting it symbolically, but uniting the African world in a tangible way. Um, Really showing the African world our possibilities when we do put our best foot forward together. And Mr. Garvey taught us, he what he was one of the ones who was very instrumental in removing those chains from not just our body, but our minds. You know what I'm saying? And he kind of sold being black back to black people, you know, teaching us that black is beautiful, teaching us that we belong to something that's bigger than where we are and that we are not a minority, but we're actually a global majority. And so that is a figure that black children must be introduced to and ingratiated in at their most questionable ages. So I could go on and on about Mr. Garvey, Brother Omawale, but that's one of those figures. Before we learn about George Washington, before we learn about Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, Black children have to know who Marcus Garvey is. He He brings a mindset. He introduces Black children to a mindset that is fundamental. So that's why uh, I chose Marcus Garvey, and that's why uh, the Honorable Marcus Garvey is so important and pivotal. pivotal. Yeah, uh, shout out to you, bro, for being solution oriented. That's definitely the the, the Garvey way, right? Uh, Garvey said, "I looked around and I said, you know, where are the black man's, uh, where's the black races men of big affairs? Like, you know, where's our government?" Where's our nation? Where's our military? He said, I didn't see one, so I built it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. So shout out to you for just, you know, having that, you know, just initiative just to just step out there like, listen, there's no word, there's no text out here for the children about Garvey, so I'm going to go ahead and write it. So right. I got to give you mad props for that. So even with my own, my mother and like my grandmother who was alive at the time, they weren't familiar with Marcus Garvey, you know, and my mother, she's 19 years old to me. My grandmother's about 45 years older than me. And, you know, these two different generations who are unfamiliar with those works. So in Garvey, I fast, I'm just trying to pick up where he left off and make, you know, African redemption a reality in the minds of you. So, yeah, tell me, tell me about the reception uh, to, to that first book when you put it out. Like, wh- how was it received? Well received, brother. 
it it was it was a um it was a euphoric experience, man. When I go to the schools and read to the children, while I'm reading, I see the teachers out of the corner of my eye scrolling through their phones, fact checking to see if this is actually real. You know what I'm saying? Just yeah. like I told you earlier, we have the um it was the same type of thing. They weren't introduced to Marcus Garvey. And because they didn't know and understand who Marcus Garvey was, they were just as naturally inquisitive. So after I finished reading, I have a Q&A session with them, and they'll have that, the teachers now, principals sometimes too, they'll have their own hands up asking these questions about Mr. Garvey, trying to get more understanding and information about him. So it's very well received and very enlightening. Like it's a, it's a beautiful experience, bro. Very, like, <laughs> I mean, it's God. It's a divine experience, to be honest. You Just know what, man? I'm about, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to shoot you an idea for free right now <laughs> on, on on this interview, right? Because while you, while you're speaking to me, what's coming to my mind? You know, we li- we we live in this crazy era where it's like, you know, let a trans person come in and 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 read to your kids. You know, with the genitals hanging out and all types of like craziness, right? But like, wouldn't it be dope if we had a group of black men across this nation looking for elementary schools during Black History Month, right? A program where we just go into the schools and like we read to the kids, read them, read from your book. Teach me about Garvey, right? The call it, call it the teach me about Garvey initiative or whatever you want to call it, you know, call it Mama Ruby's bookshelf initiative. We go in and, you know, we just find a classroom. I know a lot of teachers, you know, like, hey, let me let me read this book. To your, to your student, wouldn't that be dope? Like, wouldn't that set set the young the young minds on fire if we did something like that? Yeah, man, it's powerful. Just the just the uh, just the aesthetics of it alone. Them seeing black men coming into their place of learning and introducing that type of information to them is meaningful. Let alone the content of the book. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, what I'm gonna tell you something, bro. A black child hearing that boom. And a black man's voice means something. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like yeah. they they hear their father. You know what I'm saying? They see their daddy. They see their uncle. They see their granddaddy. You know what I'm saying? Like it's natural. It's natural. The black man is supposed to. The black man has a commanding posture naturally when he's in front of black children. So that would definitely be powerful, man. And then you know, just the book itself. I'm a, I'm gonna put out the call right now. I'm gonna you know put out I mean? the call right now. Listen. I need 100 black men. I need 100 black men to reach out and I'm going to plug y'all in. This is what we're going to do. Uh, black History Month 2023. 100 black men to agree to search out a classroom in your local community and schedule a date, right? Schedule a date during Black History Month to go in and read this book to that class. I need 100 black men. So jump into my DM. Jump into the comment section. Let's make that happen. It's powerful. Hold on, I got to got to drop a bomb for that. We got to make because I'm inspired, bro. Just, just like just, just, just the vision, right, of a masculine, strong, like black man just being in front of a group of our children, mm-hmm. reading to them mm-hmm. uh, this this heroic figure that they know nothing about because he's a race, you know, from from our history, from our story, and we have to remember him so we can regift him. You know, so, so the generations come up behind us. So let me ask you, like, who are some of the notable people who reached out to you that you were surprised, like, when they came in contact with your with your first book? You know, uh, the there's a brother. He's an actor. He acts in the Soul Food series, and he actually acts in um, I forget the name of the show. I think it's the I think it's the Law and Order. Don't quote me. His name is Rock Dunbar. His wife actually reached out to me first and, you know, let me express her support of what I was doing. They have young children. She wanted, she actually ordered some of the books and after she ordered them, she reached out and let me know. Then he started following me. Then I ain't gonna lie, bro. Uh, The movie, The Wood, you remember The Wood? Mm -hmm. What's her name? Melinda. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. The the one whose brother punched uh, homie in the face? Bro, listen, man. (laughs) Ah, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm talking about she, hey, I was in sixth grade when that movie came out, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like, to see her follow me, I I had I just like, I ain't sliding a DM. I was just like, hey, 
man, I'm a fan. I can't believe you followed me. And she started, you know, she sent me the little LOL. But those yeah. were the most notable um, figures. But really, when we talk about notable, like the teachers, different teachers and educators, those are notable figures to me, bro, because those are the ones who are underpaid, overworked, standing mm. in front of our children five days a week, you know, really kind of doing it on GP a little bit. They get paid, but it's, you know, they have to play mama, daddy, therapist, nurse. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Every teacher that reaches out to me and extends their support um, and acknowledges what I'm doing, those are my notable figures, bro. Woo, I'm a bomb for that. Listen, speaking of teachers, right? You've, you know, I always say we have a great deal of walking libraries in our community, you know, uh, Booker T. Washington said that the world is our classroom and we can learn from everyone and everything. So I know that someone who was very impressionable in your development was Mama Ruby. Speak, yeah. speak to me about this great African warrior. Who Who is Mama Ruby? Mama Ruby is my late grandmother. Mm -hmm. That woman was like my second. She was like my, she was like my parent. You know, I, I always say I had two mamas. I was blessed to have two mamas. Uh, Mama Ruby, my mother, Joy, and then my grandfather, Daddy Thomas. Those were the three that raised me. And I give them all equal. Uh, they all had an equal share, and equal part in raising me. But Mama Ruby, uh, you know, everybody has that loving grandmother, but she poured into her family. She poured mm -hmm. into her grandchildren. And, you know, my father, he, uh, he was killed before I was born. And so she took a special... I want to say she took a special liking to me and, and took to me in a way that I, I can't even really compare it to anything. You know what I'm saying? But Mama Ruby made sure that I was equipped with the type of knowledge that was necessary. Not more than just loving all, oh, baby, come here, come talk. More than just that. That was the first person. She was the first and second. Mama was like that too. But Mama Ruby was the first person who made Africa real to me, you know? Mm. I'm talking about when I was young, she said, you know, James, these things that we eat. And I, you know, I was a young boy, I didn't care about any of this. But she said, you know, the things that we eat, we're not supposed to be eating this. She said, the things that we supposed to eat are back in Africa. And I was like, what? She said, yeah. She said, you know, that's why uh, my mother had diabetes, had to get her leg cut off. That's why your great grandfather died of a stroke. You know, just breaking things down to that level. But anyway, she reattached, that's the first person that reattached me to Africa and mm. made me feel like I belonged to something that was beyond my comprehension. You know what I'm saying? And we, you know, we we shared, we shared a relationship like none other, man. And uh, I lost my grandmother two years ago to COVID. Yeah, and, I'm sorry to hear that, bro. Yeah, I appreciate that, bro. But, you know, it, it was a hard, it was hard for me, it was rough. But, you know, now that, you know, I've moved past the some, I'm able to reflect on all the different lessons and times that we shared. So, you know, it was one of my ultimate blessings. Uh, when Mama Ruby died, she died in my arms. And so uh, one of the things I did was I cut a little piece of her hair off. And this past June, my kids and I went to Tanzania, our first time to the continent. And I was able to bury that hair in Africa. Mm. So now part of Mama Ruby resides in Africa, you know? That's love, bro. That's love. You said, you know, you've been reflecting on some of the, the lessons that she she's taught you over the past few years. Like, what's some of those lessons that could that come to mind that kind of like just give you light and lift your spirit when you think of them? Just how she told me, she told me when I wrote to teach me about Garvey book, thank God she was able to live and see that. Uh, she said, James, you've created something that nobody can ever take away. She said, that's here in the world now. And he'll forever live on, you know. She said, uh, uh, just a lot of, okay, here comes that grandmama part. You know, your grandmama can make you feel like you're 10 feet tall. You know what I'm saying? She made me feel like nothing was unachievable. All it took was putting your mind to it. She's actually the first person that got me writing, that showed me that I had a talent in writing. Uh, I remember when the Power Ranger movies, when the Power Ranger movie came out, and I was like, man, Mama Ruby, I wish we could have a movie like that, you know, with, with black act, you know, with black power range or something. She said, well, write it. She said, go in there and write it. You can make it a movie. I said, I was going to do it a movie. She said, well, you got to write it first. We'll figure out how to make it a movie. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So yeah. I went in there and wrote it. And, and that was something. 
uh, Mama Ruby was one of the first people, uh, as I got older, she was one of the first people that introduced me to the notion that integration wasn't a good thing, you mm. know? Yeah, and my grandmother, she was a school teacher, and she was able to speak from a vantage point that was valuable. But she was one of the first people that said, hey, integration wasn't all good, you know? We lost a lot there. She had a lot of friends who were black business owners who failed after integration took place. She even went on to so much to tell me just, just hygiene wise things were different. You know, she saw things from, from many different lenses. She was a wise old woman, mm. wise woman, brother Oma Wale. So, man, hey, this turns to a whole different podcast. We get to talk about Mama Ruby. Yeah, shout out to Mama Ruby, man. Yeah. Uh, shout out to her. That's love, man. It's, 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 it's a beautiful thing that, you know, she, she impacted you and impacted your trajectory and your life in that way. Her pouring that love and that, that light into you, man, you have a special anointing to do, to do the work, uh, you know, that, that you're doing. Right. So, uh, mama Ruby's bookshelf, tell me about her bookshelf, right? Cause that's, that's the, that's the, uh, the imprint under which you release all, all of your writing. So tell me about this. She had multiple bookshelves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She <laughs> had one. She had one in almost every room. Mm. That's the only house I ever remember seeing a bookshelf in the hallway. At the end of the hallway was a bookshelf. She had a bookshelf at the end of the hallway, bookshelf in her room, bookshelf we used to call it the bunk bedroom. She had a bookshelf in there. My granddaddy had bookshelves down in there. She believed in having access to a plethora of knowledge, bro. She made sure that when you come in that house, it was a loving house, but it was a house full of information. You know what I'm saying? And she made sure that part of our pastime involved reading. You know what I yeah. mean? And, um, you know, by her being a school teacher, she understood the importance of black children having that head start on reading and reading comprehension and being able to understand words and the command of the English language and, you know, just everything that goes into that. So she had a lot of bookshelves and she had a lot of different literature. She was a devout Christian woman. So she had a lot of, uh, she, had a, she had several Bibles. She had a lot of Bible stores, but that's the first place again, brother Oma Wale. And, and that's why it's so important. It's the first place I saw books on black history. I got a book uh, that I took from her house after she passed on African history from back in the 1950s, you know, and, and just, you know, it had contributors like John Jackson and people like that. But, just some of the artifacts that were captured and, you know, them speaking from their perspective during that time is grand, bro. And I can, you know, she's such, that's a godly woman. I, you know, the gifts that she gave me are still given and the things that she left behind are still useful and meaningful. So, yeah, when it comes to that Mama Ruby's bookshelf, she had a few of them. And, you know, in our households, we may stand, we, we may need to stand to have a few of them. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, I yeah. do. Do me a favor, bro. I I want you to take a moment here to just un because you know this legacy and this lineage that I'm hearing you uh unveil here is is a very special one. And to the untrained eye, right? A lot of folks who are, you know, in this new generation who don't really have an attachment or have access to reading materials or have access to our brilliant minds, right, and our brilliant storytellers. They look at us like, you know, y'all Pan-Africanists, uh, y'all Pan Pan-Africanists, y'all, y'all ashamed of being black Americans and all, and all this other nonsense that they talk about. But talk to me about your Southern heritage, bro. You're from Tennessee. Yeah. And you have you have a grandmother and a family that's deeply rooted. Talk yeah. to me about the significance of your Southern heritage. Well, you know, both sides of my family, my father's side and my mother's side are both from the South. So my mother's side, we're from Nashville, Tennessee. And my father's side, they're from Athens, Alabama. Mm -hmm. and deep ties, deeply tied to the South. In the South, even growing up, the experiences that I've noticed growing up in the South and then visiting in the North, sometimes there's an underlying we have an under, I'm not gonna say all of us, not all of us, but there's still a passiveness in the South. You know what I'm saying? There's still, you know, like I, I'm in Atlanta now, right? It's still certain exits between Atlanta and Nashville that I'm not comfortable getting off at. You know what I'm saying? 
Uh, I don't go to Alabama too much. I didn't grow up with my father's side like that. But the times that I've been, they'll tell you, hey, just try and get straight here, baby. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, get, gas up. for you. Now, Alabama, it ain't that far from Nashville. But, you know, it's still that same underlying concerns that's been there for generations and generations. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that book, The Green Book. You mm -hmm. know, like that's that was a pivotal thing back then. Yeah. You know what's crazy? Um, you know, so my my mother's side is from Alabama and my father's side is from a small town just out of, out of right right outside of Savannah, Georgia, a little a little one light, one light town, Long County, Georgia. I ain't gonna give the but the specific town, but um growing up, um, you know, I had the opportunity to be raised under some first generation northerners. Right. So folks who were adults when they migrated, you know, to the north. So my dad was eight years old, but a lot of his aunts, because they all they all kind of like um, coalesced in one neighborhood. So it was very interesting, like in Philly, like, you know, you'll have, you know, just different uh, family names. Like you have like the Smalls, the Boyds, the Wrights. They just be like deep in this one area. So my family, where I'm from in Philly, like we was super deep because like when we migrated you know north like all of the family came and then you have families who were close neighbors in the south and they came north and like married into one another right so mm -hmm. i had the opportunity just to grow up under that and every summer like clockwork we would travel back down south to spend time with the family right uh, in the south and what's interesting is i was recently watching a documentary on soul food and the brother was talking to his elderly mom and they were talking about, you know, back in the 80s when they used to like cook the fried chicken and put it in a brown paper bag and travel with it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, damn, like when we used to travel down south, we did the same thing. Like, you know, mom, grandma, aunts, like they would cook the food and put it in brown paper bags. So we wasn't stopping yeah. on the road. And it just it just made me think like, man, this is a tradition mm -hmm. that we've been doing for a long time out of necessity. Like yeah. you could you couldn't stop on the road. You had to gas up and make sure you had, you know, enough sustenance because you know you stop, you put you put yourself in jeopardy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my great grandmother used to do that. My mom was telling me about how when they were young, they might go to Florida or something. My great grandmother, she packaged them all up. They'd have a they almost have a cooler full of bags and stuff. It's yep. stopping though. They're trying to get straight to the destination, you know. So yeah, now nah, that's funny. It's funny, you know, sharing those same type of experiences, you know. Let's uh, pivot really quick, right? Because you said you, you, I know you went to Tennessee State, um, which is HBCU. Shout out to my homegirl, Court. Big Court you went to Tennessee State as well. Uh, but um, you said you learned about Garvey when you were 25. So walk, walk me through that. You know, what, what was the entryway to Garvey for you? And, what, and what, what's the context? Like, where were you in your mental space or, or in your, your, your journey, your developmental journey when you, when you came into Garvey? So actually, I learned about Malcolm X first. When I was in kindergarten, my mother came and got me out of school and took me to see the Malcolm X movie. Big, that was a big, special moment in my life. Because I didn't grasp it all at the time, but I knew this is important for her to come get me out of school. So I became fascinated with Malcolm um, over the years. When I got to high school, I kind of uh, pivoted from Malcolm to Farrakhan because she introduced me to Farrakhan. You know, the videos and things like that. Farrakhan was the first person I heard talk about Marcus Garvey. And when I heard about, when I heard the name, it stayed with me. But I didn't really look into it. I go to TSU. We learn some different things. And um, I heard about John Henry Clark. We watched the video, A Great Mighty Walk by Dr. Mm -hmm. Clark. And he said that name again, too. I said, this man's got to be important. I've heard Malcolm talk about him. I've heard Farrakhan talk about him. And now here's this wise old man whose eyes are closed talking about Mr. God. So that became those three were my true introduction to him. But after I heard Dr. Clark talk about him, I looked into him a little bit more. And even after I graduated, still went into him. And um, yes, I'm sorry, yes. So after I graduated, I was watching some more Dr. Clark, saw more about Garvey, and then that's when I started looking into him. So I say I had heard about him before 25, but 25 was when I really delved that deep into him, you know? Because uh, growing up, 
you fed Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, you know, your typicals. And, you know, they were warriors in their own respect. Yeah. But they walked in a pathway created by Mr. Garvey. And I'm talking about, we talking about a wide lane. You know what I'm saying? That man created a pathway that no one has duplicated since, you know. Every, every movement of the 20th century has its roots in the Garvey movement. That's right. That's like right. literally, you know, when the, the, the FBI, which was created to bring down the Garvey yeah. movement, uh, yeah. when they were developed after um, the success of their counterintelligence efforts, when they fragmented the movement, all of the movements that we know of that impact the 20th century are folks who had ties to that original Garvey movement. Exactly. It speaks of the power exactly. of what that movement was doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and even with, um, and that shocked me, well, not shocked me, but to see, once I learned about Garvey, to see like, oh, Elijah, Muh uh, Elijah Muhammad comes from this Garvey movement. Much of the Nation of Islam, which I have a lot of respect for that uh, Same here. organization, mm -hmm. the Nation of Islam, is rooted in Garveyism, and a lot of Elijah Muhammad's approaches and tactics. He just put his he just put a religious spin on it. Yeah, he yeah. did, and uh, you know, and rightfully so because because yeah, you know, it was it was necessary because he 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 had to rebirth a dead people. Yeah, he did. You know, I think that we still had some element of of, of spark and bright eyed, you know, like you know, bushy tailedness during Gar Garvey's period because it was kind of like you know up from slavery, right? Right, Booker T. Washington. But by the time Elijah Muhammad comes around, like we had been demoralized, right? Right. You know, so he had to like literally revive us, and breathe right. the spirit of of of, of life back into us you know what i mean because you talk about that passiveness like that was we was walking around head down you know yeah. and jiving like you know like yeah we boot licking yeah uh, elijah can he stand up and clean up right so yeah you had little white boys calling grown Mac, black men boy boy mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so yeah you know these figures and and that that made, when you learn about God, when I learned about God, it made me understand Mr. Muhammad and Brother Malcolm X and so forth a lot better. And that's another reason, that's what kind of led me to my Malcolm book as well, because Malcolm is more notable, he's more known than Garvey is, but a true, in the way that I wrote my book on Malcolm, a true, um, Recount of Malcolm will bring you back to Garvey. You know what I'm saying? And so, um, yeah, Marcus Garvey, I, I don't even know where to begin. That's a, he's necessary. It's, that's a fundamental component. He should be a fundamental component of every black child's education. And socialization. No, man, um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in agreement with you there. So listen, let's transition just real quick. Your, your latest book. Teach me about Malcolm. I already understand the inspiration, but what was the process, right, for writing uh, uh, Teach Me About Malcolm, and how long did it take you to finally get it done? Teach Me About Malcolm, I started on it back in, and mind you, I've been into Malcolm for the last, I'm talking about really kind of been into him for the last 10 years. And to compress what I know about Malcolm into a children's book is actually somewhat more tedious because you want to make it, you want to create it in a way that's digestible for them, even on down to the word selection. So I started writing it back in September and I finished the transcript or the manuscript rather. I finished the manuscript right around April. And then from there, I connected with a brother in Nigeria and uh, who's an illustrator. And he did a phenomenal job in um, capturing what I was trying to convey verbally, artistically, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, uh, he did a good job. So all in all, the process probably took about six or seven months. And I'm actually, the books are actually on their way from China as we speak. Actually, they're in Georgia now in Savannah at the port. They're just waiting the customs exam. But they're here now. So 
the writing process and producing it, that took about seven to eight months, about six, seven months. And uh, but getting it to the people is taking uh, a little longer, a little over a year. But this is probably now my favorite one is actually my red, black, and green book, but this, the feedback that I've gotten on this from the different uh from the different bookstores, uh, from the different teachers that I've sent it to, and even other influencers has been phenomenal. Uh, that book, I touch a lot, it's about Malcolm, but we touch a lot of different areas with it. And what we're doing is, what I'm doing is, is I'm introducing the version of Malcolm X to children and adults who ever read it that isn't really talked about. Uh, your name, Omawale. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in a lot of children's books about Malcolm. Even though it's in his autobiography, I don't see that a lot. I have to touch on that in this book. One thing about this book, Brother Omawale, Brother Omawale, and I hope I'm not jumping the gun, is we they one thing they like to convey about Malcolm is that you know he came up a child had a dysfunctional childhood. Goes in these boys' home, become a criminal, finds out, finds the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, comes out. That is so inaccurate. That's so yeah. in, inaccurate. But that's how I like to do it. He, he leaves Elijah Muhammad, goes to Mecca, has this premonition. Now he's this new man. He's getting close to Martin Luther King. Not so much. Not mm -hmm. so much. Malcolm, and, and I say it beautifully, Malcolm was a nationalist. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and that aspect of Malcolm is not covered, especially the black children. We have to be the curators of our heroes and sheroes stories. Do me a favor, uh, and, and the spirit of Malcolm, make it plain. What is a nationalist? A nationalist, <laughs> quite simply, one who wants their own for their people. Their people having to say so over their own destiny. Uh, not falling in line under another group. Not being, their destiny not being dictated by anyone else other than themselves. Uh, having the ownership and control of the essentials of life, you know, even on down to cleaning the water, you know, I clean, I clean drinking water for a living. So I had to throw that in there, but yeah. I mean, listen, you, you, you can't like nation, right? Even on down the land. That's what Malcolm was very clear. Revolution is about land. Mm -hmm. you, you cannot be a people who've been stolen from land and have, you have had your stewardship of land removed from you. Right. and be a nation. So, you know, if you're a nationalist, it also means that you are fighting mm -hmm. to recover that which has been taken. And Malcolm said, the first thing that you got to recover is that African mind. He said, right. I, I don't need you to go back to Africa uh, <laughs> uh, physically. He said, go back philosophically. Mm -hmm. Go back spiritually. Go back mentally. Recover that mind. He said, he said well, I ain't leading that in Africa. He said, what do you mean? You left your mind <laughs> in Africa. You understand what I'm saying? So I think that this is, this is, this is significant. And, I, and I, I, I really do love what you're doing, brother, because you're finding a way to keep this message alive in a way that is not sanitized or integrationized, right? Or Europeanized. Right. You're finding a way to, to keep it in its pure form and hand it down to our babies. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to reading this book to my son, bro. I appreciate, I appreciate it, bro. Yeah, we, we can't take a, like I said earlier, we can't take a passive approach to the development and education and socialization of our children. You know what I'm saying? And in any book on somebody like Malcolm or Garvey, any, you know, figures like them, you have to be critical. You know, there's you can't introduce Malcolm X to black children without being critical of the white man. You can't. And that has to be that has to be introduced to them at those impressionable ages. Uh, Dr. Khalid Muhammad said one time he was in one of his speeches, he said something like, you know, he was talking to the black women. He said, you have to be with a cold soldier. You have to have a soldier. This, that's true. And we have to start early in developing those type of soldiers with that type of mindset. You know what I'm saying? We see everything that's going on right now in the media from, you know, Kyrie to Kanye and all this stuff. 
And you've got these figures like Shaq, big black man, Shannon Sharp, big black man, Charles Barkley, Stephen A. Smith, up there looking like puppy dogs acting like big puppy dogs for the white man. You know what I'm saying? Well, they lack, they lack, they lack political masculinity. Yeah. They lack. These are the men our children see. Even Mm -hmm. though too, you know, and I, I athletically and you know what he's done for the guy. I love LeBron, you know, on the court. He's another one. Like these are men that take a, take a subservient posture when they up there in front of the devil. You know what I'm saying? But they don't, they don't, they don't know. Right. Like and, and and their mind, you know, because of the way in which they've been manufactured, mm-hmm. in their mind, what they're doing is wise. Right. It's, it's prudent, you right. know, monetarily to move in the way that they are moving. Mm-hmm. That's because they're missing half of the picture. That's right. And understand what I'm saying? Because it's like, you know, um one of the things that I'm trying to do uh in in the new year is I'm trying to actually be a compliment to this new so-called, you know, financial literacy movement. Mm -hmm. Because like from my perspective, to have financial literacy, right? Financial literacy can teach you how to attain wealth, but political literacy will tell you what to do with it. Right. Right. Having financial literacy without political literacy is like having a gun without bullets. Mm -hmm. Right. Or having a gun and bullets without a target. Right. Like the, the two have to work together. The wealth and the resources have to have some lens that is critical, that that points us in that nationalist direction, that orients us properly towards liberation. And you can't be liberated financially or other ways under on somebody else's terms. Yeah. And I heard it once said, there's no, there's no such thing as black power and white dollars. So that that is a temporary way station on the road to freedom because we do have to get resources. We do have to be financially literate because you got you got to know how to manage resources. Manage this is all necessary. White people didn't create money, so you got to learn how to be a steward of it and 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 access and, uh, or, or deploy monetary ingenuity. This is something you absolutely need to know how to do. Mm-hmm. But if you don't have that political backdrop, which gives you the color and the contour to really give you a clean picture, then you're missing it. And I think that that's what's missing in so many of the discussions. It's so centered on money that you can risk, you know, turning yourself into a prostitute. Okay? Right. Yourself, sell, put yourself on an auction block. Exactly. And, and that goes that goes directly back to what I'm trying to do, Brother, Oma, Mo, Brother Omawale, and going back to your recommendation. That's why Black men and Black women have to bring this type of information to our children early. And like you were saying, you're talking about those athletes that I was talking about, how they have half the picture is the other half. You know what I'm mm. saying? We got to give it to them early. So I agree 100% with everything you just said. All right, brother. I got to wrap up over here because I got the young, my, my princess, she's about to pop back in here at another second. So I want to ask you, who's next in the Teach Me About series? Um, and then let us know, like, one when people can get it in stores, how they can get their hands on it, and how people that want to connect with you, how can they connect with you? So uh, the next thing to teach me about series, I'm really leaning towards Emotel uh, mm. for the youngsters. Um, you know, going taking it back to the continent um, in one of the most uh, important and intriguing places uh, and the contributions made by Brother Emotel. So I'm, I'm leaning towards him for my next one. Um, as far as the books, uh, Teach Me About Garvey and Red, Black, and Green, Tell Me What It Means, those are available right now on mrbookshelf.com, M like Mama, R like Ruby, bookshelf.com. They're also available on Amazon. Malcolm, Teach Me About Malcolm, will be available on December the 9th. Uh, that will be on the same website, mrbookshelf.com. M like Mama, R like Ruby, Bookshelf. A, that means it's available today because I'm dropping this on December the 9th. It's available. So yeah. It's available today. Yeah, Hit the available. link in the description. We got Kwanzaa coming up. Y'all looking for good gifts of a good nature? Yeah, you know I'm saying halal gifts, so to speak. Cop up. Yeah. Support. Jump in. Jump in. You know, I don't, I don't know if I'm going get to get, get an affiliate link, but even if I don't, Jump in the description right now, smack that link, go purchase a copy ASAP.
Yeah, yeah, definitely. Y'all follow me on Instagram at James Wrights 615. James, then writes like with a pencil, 615. You can follow me at the same handle on Twitter and Facebook. Uh James Wright 615. So yeah, that's how you keep in touch with me, man. And I listen, I follow back, DM me anything you need to. If you, if you disagree with me, you know, let me know. You know, I'm open to all discussions. So almost all discussion. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel you on that. All right, brother James McGee, the final word. What you want to leave the people with? Um, our children, black children are on a death march. And the only ones who can reverse that are the parents and the educators and those in the community who have true love for black children. Um, we have a task at hand that was left upon us by giants. And it's a task that we can see out but we do have to make up our minds and decide that we want to continue on this sojourn on this planet. Uh, and before I go, brother Omawale, thank you, man. I really appreciate you having me on your platform. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while. I've been following you for a while. I watch all of your interviews. I try to catch them all. But what you're doing is necessary, bro. And on behalf of all African people around the planet, thank you, bro, for what you're doing for our people. Girl, I appreciate that, for real. I appreciate that. Listen, family, y'all go ahead. Matter of fact, do me a favor. Yo, check this out. Run my uncle Mo out his likes. Make sure you go ahead and smack the like button. If you're here for the first time, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Jump in the, in the description. Hit him up in the DM. Get your copy today, and we out. Peace. Going off topic. Off topic. You really off topic right now. Yo, you way off topic. How is it that everybody's over here and you way over there off topic?